بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم اسلام علیکم ڈیئر سٹوڈنٹس ان ٹوڈے سیشن اگین وی وڈ کانٹینیو ویڈ آور نوویل ڈیٹ وی کرنٹلی آر سٹیڈنگ ڈیٹ اس گریٹ ایکسپیکٹیشنز ٹوڈے وی وڈ سٹارٹ پارٹ ٹو آف دس نوویل بیفور آئی گو انٹو دی ڈیٹیلز آف وٹ وی وڈ ڈو ٹوڈے آئی وڈ لائک ٹو شیئر ا کوئک ریویو آف دی پریویس لیسن ان دی پریویس لیسن وی continued part one of the novel and actually from chapter 13 onwards that is from chapter 13 to 19 were covered in that session thus we finished part one in the previous session we explored the text of these chapters we explored the themes I discussed the development of characters I critically looked at the selected parts of text and presented some important points in relation to the development of plot. So starting part 2 chapter 1 let us see what happens. With the first chapter of part 2 actually another phase of the journey of Pip starts. He goes to London. As he reaches there it is very ironic that as compared with his last images of the marshes he finds it ugly, crooked, narrow and dirty. He meets with Jaggers who tells him that he will be living with Matthew Pocket. He also meets Vamek who is Jaggers square mouth clerk. Jaggers seems to be an important and powerful man as Pip finds that there are lots of people waiting outside his office muttering his name among them. In order to have a feel of what kind of this phase of Pip's life is, I have selected some text from chapter 1 of this part so that I could share it here with you and we could see what kind of uh, imagery and symbols are used to convey what kind of life Pip is going to have. Mr. Jagger's room was lighted by a skylight only and was a most dismal place. The skylight centrically pitched like a broken head and the distorted adjoining houses looking as if they had twisted themselves to deep down at me through it. There were not so many papers about as I should have expected to see and there were some odd objects about that I should not have expected to see such as an old rusty pistol, a sword in a scabbard several strange looking boxes and packages and two dreadful casts on a shelf of faces peculiarly swollen and twitchy about the nose. Mr. Jaggers' own high back chair was of deadly black horsehair with row of brass nails round it like a coffin. The image of a coffin box with brass nails around is used to create the image of something dreadful, something horrifying, something that maybe Pip would not have expected before. And I had fancied I could see how he leaned back in it and bit his forefinger at the clients. The room was but small and the client seemed to have had a habit of backing up against the wall. The wall especially opposite to Mr. Jagger's chair being greasy with shoulders. This shows a lot of people coming there, standing there. I recalled too that the one-eyed gentleman had shuffled forth against the wall when I was the innocent cause of his being turned out. Text continues from part 2 chapter 1. When I told the clerk that I would take a turn in the, uh, in the air while I waited, he advised me to go around the corner and I should come into Smithfield. So I came into Smithfield and the shameful place being all a smear with filth and fat and blood and foam seemed to stick to me. So I rubbed it off with all possible speed by turning into a street where I saw the great black dome of St. Paul's bulging at me from behind a grim stone building which a bystander said was Newgate Prison. Following the wall of the jail, I found the roadway covered with straw to deaden the noise of passing vehicles and from this and from the quantity of people standing about smelling strongly of spirits and beer, I inferred that the trials were on. So again the kind of images that are used by Dickens to create and to present to us, to the readers, the environment that Pip found there is very very interesting. What we can notice is 
the blobs, the marks, the filth, the fat, the blood and the sticking smell everywhere. Interestingly, a very strong image that is of prison is introduced. Um, the building of Newgate prison that as it was told by somebody standing there to Pip is a kind of foreshadowing of the fact that the criminal element that Pimp th uh, Pip thinks that he has got rid of would still continue in his life. It is very very interesting with reference to this uh, novel of Dickens that from the very beginning till the very end the, the element of criminality it not only exists, it is not only present, rather it is predominantly present throughout the novel. When we started the novel in chapter 1, we saw Pip in the graveyard, in the marshes, meeting a convict. The story moved forward. In the second chapter, there was yet another convict um, that was found. Then there was a reference to policemen who were looking for, who were searching for the convicts. Then we noticed the elements of criminality present through the next chapters with reference to the fight that Pip had with a pale young man in uh, Miss Havisham's garden in, in her uh, place, uh, at her place in Satis House. We uh, noticed this presence of the element of criminality even after that there was this one-eyed man who with um, the same file that Pip had given to the convict a long time ago he was stirring his um, beer at the pub and he was looking and he was staring at Pip with a lot of curiosity and a lot of messages in his uh, eyes. So uh, this element of criminality that also had another associated element that is of guilt in Pip's life, they continued throughout and even now that the next phase of his life has started, he has shifted from one phase of life to the other. And this shifting of phases we also need to understand is not only, you see, is a shift in the journey of his life itself, but also you see the whole background, the geographical setup is completely different. The marshes, the village, the simplicity of that life, the low class life with the forge, um, working there um, as apprentice of uh, Joe, everything is left behind. And a new part of life is started. However, interestingly, in this new phase or new part of life, the element of criminality along with the guilt associated with this um, criminality continues and again um, the references to the presence of filth, fat and blood in form and a very very clear reference to Newgate prison they tell the keen reader they foreshadow what is going to happen maybe some worse things are going to happen Following the wall of jail, he found the roadway covered with straw to deaden the noise of passing vehicles. So, no good image, no positive image, nothing pleasant is seen by Pip. We need to see it in the light of the great expectations with which Pip has come here. Rather, there is smell, people standing there smelling strongly of spirits and beer. So, references to trials, prisons, smelly, stinky people, all these are references to um, maybe what is going to happen to uh, the expectations of Pip. Some important discussion points with relation to the um, chapter. Um, we have started noticing that structurally now the chapters are comparatively short. The series of quick brief chapters inaugurate the second phase of great expectations marked by Pips receiving his new fortune as he reaches London. The whole setting as I have already said has changed with the shift from marshes to London. How Pip's great expectations are going to be challenged at the outset as we notice that he finds London stinky and ugly. One of the first things Pip sees after his arrival in London is the terrible gallows of Newgate Prison which gives Pip a sickening idea of London. 
the points to ponder with relation to this chapter are about the use of symbols. Places are used as symbols by Dickens, as I have earlier mentioned, the Newgate prison, for example. Pip's attitude towards places is also symbolic. How Pip looks at all this, how he feels disgusted, how um, he is horrified with all this, how, for example, to have some air he comes out of the room, all this is very, very important. This attitude of Pip towards all this also indicates how very difficult uh, maybe it is going to be for Pip to adjust in this new setup. Gallows as a symbol of threat and fear in relation to the theme of guilt, the symbol of criminality. Now we see the symbol of gallows where he is, um, he feels threatened, the, the fear he is reminded of the convict. People's faces are also symbols. What we notice is the faces here lack all that simplicity, all that innocence that he experienced at Joe's forge. With relation to new experiences and new people that Pip comes across in London, there are a few important things to say. Pip's new acquaintances are unlike anyone he has ever known before, and they make his transformation into a gentleman an unpredictable one. Remember, he has come, uh, come here to London with a lot of expectations, actually great expectations. But the um, scenes here, as Dickens has presented them, they do not present a very, very wel welcoming picture. Jaggers is hard cold and powerful, but beneath the surface he seems disgusted by his own work. All this setting and characters around Pip raise serious questions about his upcoming social uplift and the change that he is supposed to undergo. And we as readers start wondering what kind of a change would come in his personality, what kind of social uplift he would have, would he be able to enjoy that uplift? Would this social uplift be positive for him? The change that would come into his personality, is it going to be positive or negative? How these changes are going to affect his relationships? All these serious questions raise as we go through this introducing chapter of part two. Some more text from chapter two that uh, presents the ugliness and um, that also shows the art of characterization on part of Dickens is presented here. Uh, the narrator Pip says, Casting my eyes on Mr. Wemmick as we went along to see what he was like in the light of day, I found him to be a dry man, rather short in stature, with a square wooden face, whose expression seemed to have been imperfectly chipped out with a dull-edged chisel. There were some marks in it that might have been dimples if the material had been softer and the instrument finer, but which, as it was, was were only dents. The chisel had made three or four of these attempts at em embellishment over his nose, but had given them without an effort to smooth them off. So look at the description of the character of Mr. Wemmick. Considering the mastery of the... The author, that is Dickens, in his art of characterization, a lot of things are foregrounded through this all. A lot of things are foreshadowed about what is going to happen, what kind of people Pip is going to meet, what troubles he's going to have in establishing relationships with them. On the previous slide, I talked to you about different symbols and I talked about people and the faces of people as symbols. Now, in the light of that comment, look at Mr. Wemmick's description with a square wooden face. Now, this square wooden face shows a kind of hard, harsh, lifeless, dry kind of uh, expression and uh, mm, personality that is not very easy to, uh, to mingle with. 
and this is going to be one of Pip's problems to get adjusted with the people around him in London as he would stay there. Chapter 2. In this chapter we find that Wemmick introduces Pip to Herbert Pocket. He is the son of Pip's tutor with whom Pip will spend the night. Herbert and Pip both like each other. Herbert is a good man with a cheerful countenance. When we compare and contrast Pip with him, we come to know that Pip's fortune has been made for him by somebody else. Herbert is a person who is not rich but who hopes to become a shipping merchant. Well, Pip does not know who is the benefactor, who is the person who is sponsoring him. He has the slight ideas, he expects and he hopes and he thinks that it is Miss Havishams, but he is not clear about that. When he meets Herbert, he however is clear on it that Herbert is not that person because Herbert is not very rich. Soon both of them realize that they have met before. They are surprised at the fact that Herbert is the pale young gentleman whom Pip fought in the garden at Miss Havisham's place. Now this is very interesting. Pip has shifted from one phase of life to the other. He has shifted from one place to the other in the geographical sense of it as well. The scene has changed, the setting has changed. Pip and we as the readers also expect that past is left behind but the reality in this case is that the past is not left behind it still follows it chases, chases pip and it is very much there references relations from past come again and again and both of them that is herbert and pip are um, surprised to see that herbert is actually that young pale man with whom pip had a fight in miss havisham's um, garden some important discussion points with reference to chapter 2 are as follows. Pip grew up in the rural marshes where poverty reigned, but people in general were generous, sympathetic, and find, he finds himself in difficulty as he comes to London. He realizes that in contrast to his previous experience, here people are disconcerned, cruel, and artificial. The only warm person around is Herbert, whom Pip had first met under strange and violent circumstances. But we also need to remember that this is a person whom Pip has met in the context of innocence and simplicity. That is the context of the, the phase one of his life where they met. This leads us to chapter three of part two. Herbert Pocket prepares a simple dinner and explains his relationship to Miss Havisham. His father, Matthew Pocket, is Miss Havisham's cousin. Herbert Pocket tells Pip the story of Miss Havisham. And of course, it is not only Pip, but also we, the readers, who are curious to know the story of Miss Havisham. Well, what is the story of Miss Havisham? Miss Havisham, as uh, Herbert Pocket tells, fell in love with a swindler and Matthew Pocket tried to warn her about him. Remember, Matthew Pocket is the, the father of Herbert Pocket, who is a cousin of Miss Havisham's. Angrily, she demanded that Matthew leave the house and not return. Miss Havisham is then cheated by this man on the day of her wedding, he leaving her only a letter which Miss Havisham received at 20 minutes to 9, the time at which she later stopped all her clocks mm, disappeared. Now this man disappeared leaving a letter for, him, for her and what the letter was about that he was not going to turn up and Miss Havisham had stopped all the clocks and watches at her place on that time that was 20 minutes to 9 when she received the letter for her. Time stopped then. The rumor was that the fiancée had worked in con conspiracy with her younger brother who may have wanted to exact revenge on the more favored. Miss Havisham adopts Estella. Later on, she raises her to take revenge on the male gender by making them fall in love with her and then by cheating them. If you remember, when for the first time Pip met Estella, when both Pip and Estella, they were very young mm, children, even at that stage we could notice Miss Havisham was forcing Estella to break his heart. Anyhow, the next day Herbert brings Pip to meet his father and other family members.
important discussion points with reference to this chapter, especially when it comes to themes, is uh, uh, are as under theme of food and meal is very very important. Um, I think the theme of meal is a reflection of human companionship and uh, human affiliation and relationships and this theme again returns in this chapter. The meal prepared by Herbert is very simple and the table setting is balanced on a number of pieces of furniture clearly showing it as a non-traditional setup. So Dickens um, criticism of the traditional setup is the first point that we need to notice. Um, the second point that we need to notice is the future good relationship between Herbert and Pip is foreshadowed through this meal where Herbert prepares a meal for himself and for Pip and interestingly what kind of a meal it is? It is simple. So um, Dickens very subtly and Dickens very uh, clearly yet um, conveys to the reader um, a lot of clues that would help the reader interpret the relationship of the characters in future. It is interesting that Pip enjoys not only his company but also the meal. Another theme with reference to this chapter is that of social uplift and the theme of criminality also comes in. The story of Miss Havisham mirrors some of the same themes of social class and criminality that run throughout the novel as I have said earlier. Her story explains the main mystery of her life which was implied by her surroundings and her behavior much earlier in the novel. We as readers made guesses about that. Pip was also able to make some guesses but this is a time when the questions are answered and when the um, reality is revealed, when the mystery is opened to us. It answers many of Pip's questions about her and not only answers questions of Pip about Miss Havisham's her behavior and her life but also satisfies um, many answers in the questions of the readers. However, Dickens very smartly in doing so raises some new questions and what are those new questions? The questions that come to our mind and the questions that of course come to Pip's mind are who was the man who cheated Miss Havisham? Who is Estella? What is Estella's history and how is she related to Miss Havisham's? Why Miss Havisham's brought up Estella? And as the novel progresses these questions will become extremely important. However, they here they reinforce the theme of mystery. This leads us to chapter 4 or part 2. Let's see what happens in this chapter. The next day Pip visits the unpleasant commercial world of the Royal Exchange before going to Matthew Pocket's house to be tutored and to have dinner. So what we notice is number one that the proper education of Pip has started. Matthew Pockets is um, going to teach him, he is going to be tutored there and he of course would live there and would have his dinner there but before he does this he gets a chance to visit the commercial world of Royal Exchange which would lead towards um, further um, disillusionment on the part of Pip. He who has come to London with a lot of um, expectations um, with all positive connotations attached to London he would be surprised to see a lot of things here. As Pip visits the pocket household he is surprised to see the chaotic world of this household. Mrs. Pocket does not and cannot handle the household. The servants run the show, everything is managed by the servants and she doesn't know even how to rear children. So there are two nurses who are supposed to take care of young children. Pip notices the same chaos over the meal which is I think very very natural. At dinner Pip concentrates on his table manners and tries to learn the ways of social life in London. Again uh, two very contrasting elements are to be noticed. One the setting that is chaotic. 
the household of uh, mr pocket and mrs pocket is chaotic full of chaos full of confusion nothing is organized nothing is settled the children are not reared properly it is the nurses who would take care of the children and in all that background naturally the food that is served the meal that is served is um, it has to be i would say chaotic and this is how it is however in contrast to this where there is lack of perfection everywhere there is actually imperfection everywhere pip aims at perfection he concentrates on his table manners and tries to learn the ways of social life in london this becomes very very ironic in the context where the london life and the life of the people in london as we see around pip at that moment um is all chaotic and this is um ironic that pip is trying to learn the manners of this world of this place as he is trying to learn the table manners some important dis discussion points with reference to this chapter are as follows the most important thing is the theme of child abuse dickens presents child abuse as a prominent theme in his works same goes for this novel we notice the presence of this theme from the very beginning of the and again i would say this is a typo error this is t h e the this part is a typo so from the very beginning of the novel and pip as a child was treated harshly by his sister and was raised by hand now again we notice it dickens continues to present various ways in which children are oppressed and marginalized and i would like to point out that this not only happens in the rural setting not only the setting of the marshes not only in the lower class you see um, at uh, joe's household in joe's um, place at at joe's forge but also it happens in um uh, in the upper class social settings in the elite settings it also happens in the urbanized settings as dickens points it out in the pocket family the children are not necessarily physically abused though their lives appear in danger sometimes because of the lack of supervision or underfed or made to work but there seems to be psychological abuse evident by their mere numbers they are not named they are numbered the psychological abuse may be is um, more prevalent is more prominent as more and is more characteristic of the treatment of children in the urbanized elite context as compared to the rural um lower class context where it turns into physical um uh, harsh treatment and abuse the parents matthew and mrs pocket are busy in their urban superficial lives and actually they don't have any time for rearing their children up properly this brings us to chapter 5 of part 2 and uh, what happens in chapter 5 is as follows Matthew Pocket like his son is a serious honest and good person. Matthew Pocket was teaching Pip with sincerity so we can notice that Pip also tries to learn with all eagerness and he feels earnest in learning. The natural result is that he progresses. At the same time he is drawn by the city life within London and asks Jaggers if he can live permanently at the Bernard Inn with Herbert instead of boarding in Hammersmith. Jaggers agrees to that he doesn't see any harm in that. Vamick brings Pip to watch Jaggers in court where Pip observes him grinding the whole place in a mill. Pip returns to Jaggers place in order to arrange to share room with her but and there actually Pip befriends the lively Vamick who invites him to dinner. Pip sees Jaggers in the court room where he even frightens the judges with his powerful and thund thundering speeches. This leads us to chapter 6. While at the pockets Pip comes to know the family surrounding Miss Havisham. You remember the four characters that uh, we found at ha Miss Havisham's place while it was her birthday. Now out of those characters Camilla is Matthew Pocket's sister, Georgina is a cousin. Pip also grows close to Herbert as we notice through this chapter. 
Pip is invited to dinner at Wemmick's place and Pip is pleasantly surprised to see him as a different person at home. Actually, he believes that office is one thing, private life is another. Indeed, Wemmick has a wonderful private life. Although he lives in a small cottage, the cottage has been modified to look wonderful. Pip finds that Wemmick is an entertaining host, far different from the Wemmick at the office. So this personality uh, clash, this personality split in, split in Wemmick is very, very interesting for him. Office life is very different from his personal life. And the question that we as readers um, face is whether it is the requirement of the office life to be like that as Wemmick is at his office Pip observes that Wemmick seems to have a new personality when he enters his home while he is cynical and dry at work. At home he seems happy and merry. So to be cynical and dry at work, is it what the office routine and the office work has inculcated him in him or it is the requirement of the, the office, uh, situ office situation of the urban life? This is a question for us to think about. There are some important discussion points with reference to this chapter. Literally, Wemmick's uh, house is his castle. Wemmick tells in terms of defending this private home against the encroachments of the hard city life. And um, he, he not only tells about that, he not only talks about that, he firmly believes in that as well. And again, the theme of meal is presented. In this meal that is served at Wemmick's place, Pip is brought to understand how a person who is assumed to be dull can be an entertaining host. Mm, theme of disillusionments, theme of uh, misunderstandings, both the themes um, are related to this chapter. Pip had a misunderstanding about Wemmick as a dry person, as a rude person, and now this understanding, misunderstanding is um, cleared here, and what we notice is that Wemmick is a very lively person and a very good host as Pip comes to his place. Uh, this is also the theme of disillusionment that I would like to point out with reference to this chapter. Pip has come to London to learn. Pip has come to learn the ways of a better life, the ways of the upper class. He has come here uh, to have a great fortune. And in that context, when we look at Pip's um, disillusionment that starts from this point onwards, that for the first time he realizes, he understands how a person who seems to be, who can be assumed to be dull or dry, can be very entertaining, can be very friendly. I think this is the first step of Pip's understanding of people. So far what we have seen is that he has not been able to understand people very well. This brings us to chapter 7 of part 2 and as far as chapter 7 is concerned in comparison to the house of Wemmick, Jagger's house where he comes, um, that is Pip comes, is oppressive and dark. There is nobody else there but a gloomy housekeeper, Molly. Pip's fellow students attend the dinner at Jagger's with Pip and here Pip and Drummel quarrel over a loan, Drummel ungratefully borrowed from Startop. Jaggers wants Pip to stay away from Drummel, though the lawyer claims to like the disagreeable young, disagreeable young man himself. The next day, Jaggers himself invites Pip and friends to dinner. Pip brings Herbert as well as the other pocket boarders, and thus Startop and Drummel also came. Pip and his friends are irritated by the insulting behavior of Drummel. So mainly there is no big happening as such in this chapter. The whole chapter is constructed around moving from one place to the other, from one dinner to the other, from one meal to the other, one person and then the other inviting Pip and other people around and thus creating situations or possibilities of socialization. So what we understand is that um, Pip is given time there to get settled. He is 
being taught how to socialize, how to meet people, how to observe the manners that are, that are required in the upper class of the society. Dickens uses this chapter to once again present mysteries that the narrator Pip hints will be solved in upcoming issues. A lot of things happen that we are not clear about and they would be um, presented again with more clarity in the upcoming chapters. Of all the young men invited to Jagger's house, we notice that Jagger's is specially pleased and interested in the unfriendly drummel. It is also strange that Jagger's in, uh, actually he advised Pip to stay away from drummers but as far as he himself is concerned uh, he asserted that uh, he liked Drummel. It is a strange choice for Jagger's and we are led to be believe that Drummel will become a more important character later on in the novel. Theme of food and meal as I have earlier said is highlighted again. With this we come to chapter 8 of this part and let us quickly see what happens in this um, chapter. This chapter is very important in terms of some developments. Biddy writes a letter to Pip to tell him that Joe is coming to London and would like to visit him. Pip is not very happy with this news. Joe comes to visit Pip in London and moving in the comparatively higher society, Pip finds the arrival of Joe as a member of lower class to be an irritating visitor. Pip worries that Joe will disapprove of his opulent lifestyle. At the same time, he is worried that Drummel will look down on him because of Joe. The result of all these uh, feelings is that Joe's visit is full of tension. It is strained and awkward. Both Pip and Joe, they feel awkward and unhappy. Joe tells that Miss Avisham wants him to know Estella is back at the Satis house. Throughout, Joe addresses Pip as Sir. The visit is very short and Joe stays only for a few minutes. He tells Pip that he is out of his element and that if Pip would like to see him, the real Joe, and sit down and talk like old times, he should visit the forge. And this is a point where the chapter comes to an end. Well, dear students, this chapter is very important in um, the sense that it again brings in Joe and Biddy into the scene. Um, so far what we had noticed was that Joe and Biddy were left behind there in phase one of uh, the life of Pip and with his shift from the marshes, with his shift from um, the rural area to the town, actually the connection with Biddy and Joe was disconnected and it seemed as if it was over. We notice that Biddy writes a letter to Pip and tells him that Joe is coming to see him to London. Instead of being happy or being mm, joyous on hearing this, what we notice is that Pip is troubled with this news. Um, as he is now moving in a comparatively high society, um, he is living in that urban setting, he thinks Joe is beneath his um, social level, beneath his status. And Joe's visit is not only is disapproved by Pip, but also it makes Pip worry. And what he's worried about? He is worried about his image. This again brings in the themes of snobbery, of selfishness. Pip always thinks about himself, not about the feelings of others, desires of others. He doesn't think about Joe. He is not thankful that Joe is coming to meet him. Rather, he is very selfishly thinking about his own social, social status and how this visit of Joe with all his coarse and crude manners as Pip thinks of his manners, how it is going to affect um, Pip's image um, amongst the people um, with whom Pip is currently living. And as all this happens to understand how the relationships, that is the relationship of Biddy, Joe and Pip, how these relationships are moving forward and what is happening um, in terms of being close and being uh, isolated and away from each other, I think it would be a good idea to have a look at the letter that Biddy wrote to Pip. 
So this is the opening text of uh, chapter uh, actually 27 that is when I say chapter 27 actually in total that is chapter 27 of the whole novel but this is chapter 8 of part 2. So the letter by Biddy. My dear Mr. Pip, I write this by request of Mr. Gargari for to let you know that he is going to London in company with Mr. Wopsle and would be glad if agreeable to be allowed to see you. He would call at Bernard's hotel, hotel Tuesday morning 9 o'clock when if not agreeable please leave word. Your poor sister is much the same as when you left. We talk of you in the kitchen every night and wonder what you are saying and doing. If now considered in the light of our liberty, excuse it for the love of poor old days. No more, dear Mr. Pip, from your ever obliged and affectionate servant, Biddy. Well, I would say this letter is a very, very important instance of a very, very important example of how the dimensions of relationships have changed. Look at the address. The way a uh, pip is addressed my dear mr pip so he is no more pip he is mr pip the degree of formality that is involved the distance in the relationship how biddy considers herself inferior to him and he is given a superior position all this is reflected through this term of address again notice i write this by request of Mr. Gargari for to let you know that he is going to London in company with Mr. Wopsle and would be, ab yahan se notice kare, would be glad if agreeable to be allowed to see you. Ab ye notice kare, dekhe ke what is happening, would be glad if agreeable to be allowed. So it is more taking permission from Pip than informing him that Joe is coming. And then she makes a reference to that they sit in the kitchen and talk every night about him wondering what he would be saying and doing. After that, immediately it is written, if now considered in the light of a liberty, liberty please, if for the love of, uh, please excuse it for the love of poor old days. And ironically the letter closes with your ever obliged and affectionate servant Biddy. Biddy's position is now reduced to a servant from a friend. This shows how the relationships of Pip with other people are changing. As I have already said um, that uh, Biddy um, addressed Pip as Mr. Pip. We, we can notice if we read the text that when Joe comes there, he also is found addressing Pip as Mr. Pip. The um, visit is awkward, the visit is uh, unpleasant, and the, the visit is a bad experience for both Pip and Joe. Both of them feel uncomfortable um, to the extent that Joe decides to leave. This is again some part of the text taken from this chapter that shows Joe's departure as he leaves. Let's, say, let's see what he says. Pip, I wish you ever well and ever prospering to a greater and a greater height. But you are not going now. But you are not going now, Joe. Yes, I am, said Joe. But you are coming back to dinner, Joe. No, I am not, said Joe. Our eyes met and all the sir melted out of that manly heart as he gave me his hand. Pip, dear old chap, life is made of ever so many partings welded together, as I may say, and one man's a blacksmith and one's a whitesmith and one's a goldsmith and one's a coppersmith. Divisions among such must come and must be met as they come. If there's been any fault at all today, it's mine. You and me is not two figures to be together in London, nor yet anywhere else but what is private and be known and understood among friends. It ain't that I'm proud, but that I want to be right, as you shall never see me no more in these clothes. I'm wrong in these clothes. I'm wrong out of the forge, the kitchen, 
or off the meshes. You won't find half so much fault in me if you think of me in my forged dress, with my hammer in my hand or even my pipe. You won't find half so much fault in me if, supposing as you should ever wish to see me, you come and put your head in at the forge window and see Joe, the blacksmith, there at the old anvil, in the old burnt apron, sticking to the old work. I'm awful dull, but I hope I've beat out something now the rights of this at least, at last. And so, God bless you, dear old Pip, old chap, God bless you. So these are the parting words of Joe. This is what he says as he leaves. There are a few important things in this text that we need to notice. Dickens' philosophy of life, Dickens' keen observation of life is reflected in what Joe says. From the, the mouth of Joe, a simple blacksmith, when these words of wisdom come out, of course it is clear that he is serving here as a mouthpiece of, of Dickens. He says, deviants among such must come and must be met as they come. So he is conscious of the social deviants. Because he himself says very clearly, life is made of ever so many partings welded together. Zindagi mein hum kitni dafa milte hain, kitni dafa bichhadte hain. This is what whole life is. This is what he says. And then he says, one man's a blacksmith and one a whitesmith and one a goldsmith. Aur logon ke mukhtalif peshe, logon ke mukhtalif kaam hote hain. People are different. And these divisions are to be met as they come. And I would say they, these are to be met with grace, as Joe did. But as Pip was not able to do that. Again, Joe is very much right when he says that um, he does not belong to London. He does not belong to this place and he does not fit in this context. And he, with his clothes, is um, a different Joe here, which is not the true personality of Joe. And what he says that he is wrong out of the forge, out of the kitchen, and out of the meshes, that is the marshes. He belongs to the rural area, he belongs to the forge, and that is where he fits in well. And he also is aware, he is conscious, he recognizes, he acknowledges this fact that it is not Pip's fault to look down upon him or to to be uneasy or uncomfortable with Joe's presence and with a lot of grace he says is that you won't find half so much fault in me if supposing you should ever wish to see me you come and put your head in at the forge window and see Joe the blacksmith there at the old annual in the old burnt apron sticking to the old work. It is decided now Joe would leave and he would not come back again to London to see Pip. If ever Pip has to see Joe, he has to go back to the same force, to the same window, to the same sticking old working place where in the same apron with the same old anvil he would find Joe working. And from the mouth of a simple blacksmith this very realistic analysis of the situation I think is the mastery of Dickens how it is made heart touching for the reader. This brings us to chapter 9 of this part and in this part we say, see that Pip comes back to his home place. There are two purposes of this journey. There are two purposes why he's traveling back to the rural um, uh, rural um, background from where he has come. He hopes to see Estelle and also he wants to apologize to Joe. The question arises, which one of these is the major purpose for Pip? I am afraid to see Estella is the major purpose. For the journey he is forced to share a coach with a pair of convicts, one of whom is the mysterious stranger who gave Pip money in the pub. Though this man does not recognize Pip, Pip overhears him explaining that the convict Pip helped that long ago night in the marshes had asked him to deliver, to deliver the money to Pip. Pip is so terrified by his memory of that night that he gets off the coach at its first stop within the town limits. 
When he arrives at his hotel, he reads a notice in a newspaper from which he learns that Pumblechook is taking credit for his rise in status. Discussion point with reference to this chapter that I want to point out is that actually this chapter provides some answers to the questions that were previously raised. One thing that we come to know is that the convict riding with Pip in this chapter was given the pound note and presumably the file by the convict who Pip, whom Pip had helped in the opening few chapters. So what we notice is that some links with the past are being re-established. Not only links with the past are being re-established but also mysteries are being resolved now. One of the mysteries regarding why he was given that pound note and who was this person who gave him and who was the person who had sent him. The mystery related to all this uh, has started being unfolded and maybe as readers we can expect that soon we would see it resolved. This leads to chapter 10 of part 2 that may be called chapter 29 overall. Pip goes to Satis house to see Miss Havisham the next day and of course he wants to meet Estella. His imagination is at work and he thinks of himself as a triumphant knight who is going to rescue the Lady Estella from an evil castle. Pip imagines that Miss Havisham has adopted both he and Estella to raise them to be with each other. Pip also imagines that he and Estella inhabiting the old Satis house and flinging open the windows to let the sun and the breeze in. Now this is only Pip's imagination. Hai. How much it is related to reality? Of course, very little, maybe nothing. As he reaches there, he meets Orlik at the gate of the Satis house. Uh, he comes to know that uh, he is now working for Miss Havisham. Orlik is the person, remember, with whom Pip has never, able, uh, has never been able to be friended. He goes in to meet Miss Havisham and Estella. Estella has grown older and much more beautiful than before. She is so much beautiful that Pip does not recognize her at first sight. Facing her now, he slips back into the coarse and common voice of his youth and she in turn treated him like the boy he used to be. They are put into the same relationship as they were before this. The pretty and proud Estella, the coarse and common jo uh, Pip. She is coming from France and on her way to live in London. The talk of his new friends and his old friends. Who is fit for you then is not fit for you now, Estella said asking about Joe. Pip agrees and at that moment he also decides that he would not go to see Joe and Biddy. So remember what I said that um, he wanted to go to, to the village to see Estella and to apologize from Joe but the main intention was to see Estella and here even um, the pricking of the conscience is no more making him, no more forcing him to see Joe and he decides not to meet Joe and Biddy. It is significant that Pip sees something strikingly familiar in Estella's face. He cannot exactly identify the look but an expression on her face reminds him of someone. He is not able to identify who this person is. So the theme of mystery is there. Again another mystery is created. Um, Maybe Estella has some link with somebody, maybe Estella has some resemblance with somebody. What is it that Pip is not very much sure of, but he is unconsciously noticing something. Later they all have dinner with Jaggers. Some important discussion points. Estella tells Pip, I have no heart. Yes, Estella who is more beautiful now, but who is more proud now. She tells Pip that she does not have a heart. She is conscious that she is brought up by Miss Havisham as a beautiful but as an emotionless woman. In a way she is warning Pip against um, the fact that she could notice Pip's interest in herself. Miss Havisham will have her revenge on the male gender. I developed her into what she is, that she might be loved, she tells Pip. Love her. So, the same old game, play with her, love her. This is the order for
pip play with her and break his heart this is the order for estella and the things are same they have not changed in this particular connection with this we come to the end of this chapter this is the list of the references that are consulted and materials that are incorporated in the slides and before i close i would give a quick review of today's session today's session started with an introduction to part 2 that is the um, beginning of the second phase of the life of pip and we have covered the first 10 chapters of this part in um it, today's session we have we have explored the text of these chapters um in doing all this we made an attempt to explore themes as well we discussed the development of different characters we have seen how pip becomes more and more snobbish he becomes more and more selfish mm, how is more prone towards artificial life and um how he is rude towards biddy and joe we discussed um some selected parts of the text by looking at them critically and i tried to show you the changes that um are coming in pip's personality and his um attitude because of the environment in which he is living so with this note we close uh, our today's session allah hafiz